Ladies and gentlemen, in recent decades, the subject of the session I have the honor to comment upon has enjoyed the growing interest of public institutions as well as of a new historiography of sciences oriented towards both the study of scientific practices and the cultural history of sciences. One of the strong points of the session consists specifically in inviting scientists and science historians responsible for that historiographic renovation or having direct experience in curating and scientifically investigating ethnographic and naturalistic collections to contribute on this subject. Another pivotal element of the session is undoubtedly the pertinence of the subject for the conference itself. Blumenbach's world-renowned skull collection the incorporation of the Cook Forster Collection in the Academic Museum and Blumenbach's contribution to the consolidation, enlargement and scientific exploitation of Göttingen Academic Collections is eloquent evidence of that. The talks held this afternoon have pointed out how scientific collections and material knowledge are ground stones for Blumenbach's scientific practice, network and reputation as well as for the special place occupied by the University of Göttingen in the history of science and as the morning session of the conference once again testified in the historiography of science. More in general, the presentations confirmed that history of scientific collections and material knowledge is essential for our modern understanding of scientific practices and the social and political impact of natural history throughout the long 18th century. In her paper on the social, political and scientific ends of natural history specimen during the transition from old regime to Republican France, Emma Sperry revisited, revisited her, her well-known monography concerning French natural history of the 18th century by making fruitful the results of new research and digitization projects. I only mention here the digitization of auctions catalogues, which, as Emma Sperry explained, revealed how close the interpenetration, interpenetration of collecting in natural history and in the fine arts actually was. The aesthetization of natural history collection doesn't end with Baroque, but rather continues throughout the entire 18th century. On the one side, there is an adaptation to new artistic tendencies, but on the other side, there are new criteria such as, ordered, such as ordered cabinets. Collections reflect the personality of the collector, but they have a semi-personal and semi-public character. That is one of the reasons why a transition from personal to natural property was possible. This transition is subject of Paris talk consequent first to the revolutionary end of ancient regime and second to the Napoleonic imperial hegemony on continental Europe, more than one million natural history specimens changed, so to say, their scientific and social existence through displacements and reorganizations. New forms of politicization and commercialization grew up. Emma Sperry emphasizes on the one hand the use of natural historical specimens as trophies of military victory, it is as symbols of a new supremacy. On the other hand, she claims that the existence of specimens was underpinned by commercial consideration which connected collectors, intermediaries and traders. The accent on the nationalist tendencies suggests maybe a new question. Actually, Natural history constituted one of the most universal and inclusive research fields of European science, a sort of mirror of the Enlightenment intellectual's aspiration to universal sharing of knowledge. But at the same time, such a domain was always animated by patriotic or and nationalist impulses to the point that it became an unavoidable part of the construction and self-representation of the major European nations. Do we have an exhaustive explication of the relationships between national thinking and policies on the one side and the debates and scientific practices of natural history on the other? 
The question seems to me not only historiographically open, but also relevant today in the sense that we are living and operating in a historical phase in which European society seems once again to succumb to the allure of national hegemonies and national divisions. Dominic Huniga outlines the biography and scientific production of the Danish entomologist and economist Johann Christian Fabricius, a pupil of Linnaeus in contact with Banks, Blumenbach and Cuvier, in order to light up some characteristic features of scientific practices, as well as the place of natural history in the science system of the second half of the 18th century. Fabricius' self-reflections as a natural historian testified the capital preeminence of Great Britain, not only for his own career, but also for the whole natural history of the second half of the 18th century. As pointed out by Huniga, it is, for instance, in the cabinet of Hunter and in the science factory of Banks that Fabricius experiences all the prerequisites for successful natural history work. That was the av availability and right diversity of the material, patronage and funding, accessibility, and the community of scholars. As regards, as regards the relationships between Fabricius and Blumenbach, I could only add uh, two points. On the one side, both Fabricius and Blumenbach grasped the connectivity of natural history with other sciences. Fabricius' idea of natural history as an auxiliary discipline of economic sciences is analogous to Blumenbach's assertion in the Beiträge zur Naturgeschichte on natural history as an auxiliary science for the history of ancient world specifically physical anthropology for the history of ancient Egypt civilization. It is interesting to remember that Blumenbach's dealing with Egyptian mummies had begun in the context of uh, philological debates aroused in Göttingen around the end of the 70s, but it was the stay in London at the beginning of the 90s which gave him the opportunity to fully display his competence in analyzing mummies. He became an authority in rap unwrapping mummies. In contrast to that convergence, there are also some radical divergences between Blumenbach and Fabricius. In his Betrachtungen über die Einrichtungen der Natur, Fabricius gives credit to extremely racist and radically discriminatory anthropological opinions concerning the so-called Negro. Unlike Blumenbach, who firmly believes in the unit of human species and devotes a vast chapter of the Beiträge zur Naturgeschichte to the apology of Negro's intelligence and sensibility, Fabricius will explain the presumed backwardness and intellectual boundedness of the Negro as resulting from the crossbreed of white people and apes. Such a hypothesis which had been put in question by other naturalists on the basis of what Kant renamed the Buffonsche Regel, is nonetheless regarded by Fabricius as most very similar and in agreement with the analogy of nature, the latter being one of the most popular arguments of natural history and philosophy at that time. By the way, that is the reason why Fabricius denies that Adam was black. Combining history of material culture and history of science, Mike Reich conducts us to the Göttingen Royal Academic Museum, attesting how the inventory, expansion, and scientific enhancement of the museum owed much to Blumenbach's activities in its first decades. Since Blumenbach himself didn't enterprise many expeditions and travels, the richness of the collection resulted from his network and prestige. Reich uh, exemplified the surprising and fascinating variety of typology and provenience of the thousand academic collection specimens, as well as the help given by those specimens for reconstructing parts of Blumenbach's scientific network and practice. It is, in my opinion, an open question if and to what extent Blumenbach's supervision and authority brought stagnation to the collection in the last decades of his life which is the same to ask if and in what sense, towards the end of his life, 
Blumenbach's idea of scientific collection and his handling with ethnological and natural history specimens had become outdated. Also, Michael Schulz regards the specimens of Blumenbach's most famous collection as still valuable documents which exhibit an importance going far beyond the boundaries of anatomy and physical anthropology and embrace the domains of archaeology, Egyptology, cultural history, paleopathology, legal medicine, and history of medicine. That's the reason why Schulz, in his historical description and scientific appraisal of Blumenbach's skulls collection, which is substantially preserved and still includes the skulls analyzed for the dissertation of 1775, Schulz def defined these um, the skulls in a certain sense as, as interdisciplinary useful biohistorical documents. While giving us some exemplifications of that, it can be said that Schulz translated for us some speeches of those talking heads, as he once humorously in, in another article named the Blumenbach skulls. He also points out that the skull morphology witnesses the natural history of mankind since it concretely reflects human biodiversity. The leading role of Great Britain and the integration of natural history in other research fields, both already emerging in Huniger's paper, as well as the approach to human variety, which has been touched by Schulz, are recurring questions in Schick's uh, Kruger paper too. Both subject is the history of uh, Cook Forster's collection. Cook's expeditions fortified the reform of political and historical sciences at the University of Göttingen, as well as the cosmopolitan personality of Georg Forster. In both cases, the interest immediately and constantly manifested by Blumenbach towards Cook's enterprise and Forster's mediation of Cook's voyages was remarkable and full of positive consequences for the University of Göttingen and its collection. As far as the impact of Cook's discoveries is concerned, I merely recall here that Cook's expeditions forced both Buffon and Blumenbach to deeply revise their Awan anthropologies. Both naturalists extended their classification of human varieties, and what the point already touched by <laughs> Professor Richards, and especially Buffon clarifies his concept of climate and the role played by climate in the physical and cultural differentiation of the human species. Um, in the paper uh, Gundolf Kruder sent to me, there was also an interesting point concerning the long durée of Forster's originality as an ethnological writer. Uh, Forster uh, has a strong sensibility towards the problem on fremd Warnemung, and uh, his ethnological style was politically, ethically, and scientifically uh, subjective. I mean, uh, in a, in, sorry, uh, the, there was a politically, ethically, and scientifically fertile subjectivity in his ethnological style. Subjectivity in science discourse often sounds surprising and a little bit suspect. In this case, I would be tempted to intend Forster's subjectivity in ethnology in the same way as Arnold Galen, the major representative of 20th century German philosophical anthropology, who had supported national socialism and who was a declared enemy of enlightenment uh, humanism, in this case totally opposite to Forster. No? And so the way as Galen defended the subjectivity characterizing his own late criticism of modern eudaimonistic humanitarianism. Galen says, subjectivismus kann kein Vorwurf sein, wenn er in den Ansatz der Betrachtung der Dinge hineingenommen wird also eine bestimmte Perspektive qualifiziert. Now the problems subjectively grasped by Forster appear to me closely connected to the impact of the encounter with the others. Such an encounter challenges not only contemporary rhetoric and conventions, it also puts in question the position of the observer, of the intellectual, in front of political and economic power. 
The discovery of the others raises in Forster the question of the responsibility of scientists and people of culture at the time of the Enlightenment philosophers towards humanity. And Forster's subjectivity brings to light that the new ethics and the new policy of humanity are impossible without a new science of humanity, but these science cannot be generated in a colonialistic horizon. Thanks for your attention.